nothing. So, well, wait till we know this is going to be real, and then I'll give you my $20 or whatever, okay? So, yeah, it's really bad when people go online and see something like that. All right. A couple of them are really big and have a big reach. That would be like Kickstarter and Indiegogo. Some have very specific targets. So what you're really going to decide on is do I want to go broad or deep? In other words, do I want the widest possible net of people, which would be Kickstarter and Indiegogo, or do I want to focus on a particular industry, a particular segment, a particular group? So a lot of times when people are doing a medical device, they'll do MedStarter because that tends to be people who care about the health professions and they're much more likely to say, oh my gosh, there's a guy working on this. Yeah, I'll, I'll contribute some money toward that. I'd like to see that vaccine come about, you know, something like that. Um, so you can read as good as I can. I'm not going to go through the bullet points here. Uh, solar, power, uh, ethnic groups, um, the LGBT community. Puerto Rico has its own crowdfunding platform, AntRocket, where most of the projects are in Spanish. So sometimes you carve out a particular niche based on something and decide that's going to be more useful to you than Kickstarter or Indiegogo. So it's just like someone that sells camera lenses. Sure, they could reach a lot of people by being on network television or advertising on the Super Bowl, but Photography Magazine is going to have a much smaller reach, but a much higher percentage of people that would care about a camera lens. So MedStarter has a tiny fraction of people looking at it compared to Kickstarter, but almost everybody that looks at it would probably be interested in taking a look at what that medical-related project is. All right, so that's the choice of platform. One question. Yep. How do you find those more specialized? Well, there's 500 of them, so you just have to start asking around, looking around. An easy way to do it, believe it or not, is a Google search on a product similar to yours. You know, like if you were doing some kind of vaccine, you'd look up pharmaceutical Kickstarter campaign or crowdfunding campaign, and then it would direct you to some site. So I'm aware of a guy in Mentor, uh, which is northeast of Cleveland. He developed this uh, diabetes needle, like an injection thing that doesn't break the skin and doesn't bleed. Um, and he was on MedStarter. If you just looked him up, diabetes, needle, crowdfunding, it would go right to his thing. So that's one way to do it. Every, almost every one of those 500 platforms is a business. It's a money-making business. And because of the newness of crowdfunding, most of them are startups. So they're trying to get rich off of this. They get their money by charging a percentage of the money raised. And almost every time someone will ask, well, what if the campaign's not successful or you don't raise any money, do you owe them anything? And the answer is no. So they're only successful if you're successful. And the fees range from 2% to 10%. So it's worth taking a look at, okay? Keep a zip is operating more like a charity. Since I mentioned them earlier, I'll point out that they don't take a fee. So if you crowdfund a $5,000 interest-free loan, you're actually getting $5,000. On all the other platforms, if you raise $5,000, you're only getting 4,000 something because of the two to 10% fee they're taking, okay? It's more of a charitable type thing. It gets people contributing to it and uh, it's got benefactors and backers and, and people like that. And I'll also point out uh, it's a loan, but the overwhelming number of Kiva contributors roll the money back in. In other words, they'll contribute to campaigns, they get regular emails that say, you just got $1.10 back from this project, you just got this back, your account has $29 in it right now. 
So then they'll get emails saying, hey, this person is trying to buy seed. It's spring. The window is closing. You've got $29 available. Do you want to go ahead and give $25 to this guy? So very few people ever make a Kiva loan and then, oh, good, I want my money back now. They just keep looking for more projects to invest in. So think of it as sort of a charitable thing that's actually helping small entrepreneurs. Yep. Twenty-five is the typical contribution. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And I've seen people do more. Um, I know a guy that typically throws five hundred dollars at each campaign, and you can see right there he's ten percent of each campaign. So when his thing comes through, they go, "Wow!" I'm sure they send him a thank you note because that was pretty significant. Okay. All right. So whatever platform you're engaging with, look up the fee. Um, a thousand dollar campaign, that's not a huge amount of money. A hundred thousand dollar campaign, it could be a couple thousand dollars difference. You're going to have to decide how long you want this project to be. Some platforms specify, like all our projects are a month long. Some give you a choice. Um, it ranges, I think you can actually do two day campaigns on some platforms. So you obviously have to be all ready to go and send the email out and this weekend only, contribute to this, that kind of thing. Most are 30, 60, or 90 days long. Um, having that end date creates an artificial deadline. It's kind of like the day a term paper is due. You know, if there wasn't a due date, you'd never do it and you'd never graduate and you'd just end up as a bum somewhere and ruin your life. So professors have to say, that has to be turned in by noon on April 22nd. And if you said, why then? They go, hey, you know, if I don't pick that, nobody will ever turn it in. So crowdfunding is the same way. If you look at that thing, yeah, yeah, it looks kind of nice. Maybe I'll check later. Oh, yeah, it's still up there. You know, I'll check back. But if it says three days to go, you go, well, I guess I'm going to buy this thing. I better go ahead and do it. So you often play a role in what the duration is. But the research says the shorter the better. I don't recommend 90-day campaigns because people think they'll come back later and forget all about it. Okay. Yep. 30 or 60. A lot of it depends on the dollar amount. Small amount, you can get away with a smaller time. Larger amount, you need more time to get it out there. Yep. Do, do some of the platforms provide a level of analytics to say, okay, well, this many people have actually visited your page compared to the number of people who did? Um, not in great detail. Um, the small platforms just don't have the capacity to do that. The large platforms don't have the need to do that. Yeah. So it would just be some kind of in-between thing. Plus the clock is ticking. So providing the uh, project with analytics, like if you've got a week to go, what are you going to do differently in the campaign? Yeah. Choosing the goal. What are you trying to raise here? 500, 1,000? And don't be arbitrary. I've seen people say, yeah, I'm going to do $44,000. Why that? Like, what do you actually need? Yeah, I could, for 31000 I can do the production. I just thought I'd throw in some extra money to help with marketing or do this and that. And I go, well, it's almost like every additional $1,000 you add, you're reducing your chances of success. Okay, so you really need to think this through. So, here's a huge factor. Many platforms, and Kickstarter is one of them, have an all or none policy. You set a goal, people contribute, they get a note saying, okay, we've received your information, your credit card will not be charged until the project reaches its goal, and if it doesn't reach its goal, nothing happens. And then if it doesn't, those people get an email a month later saying, thank you so much for contributing to the campaign, but it wasn't successful, therefore your credit card will not be charged. Thanks again. Okay? So, again, if you were thinking, yeah, I need 31, I'm going to ask for 44, and you end up raising 40, now you have nothing. If you had done 31, you'd have $31,000. So you blew it. 
by having too high a goal that you couldn't reach. So if your goal is $50,000 and you raise $49,950, Kickstarter sends you a note saying, sorry, thanks, better luck next time. Now, if you really did raise $49,950, what would you do? Call your mom. Yeah. <laughs> Call your mom, who wouldn't put into that zero campaign, and say, Mommy, now you're going to make the difference. Isn't that fraudulent? <laughs> For her to contribute to her... No, no, no. What if you were the director of United but, Way? But Why not? What if you just um, put ninety percent of the money, of your own money in? Just okay, so, I mean, that's a very good question. What would be the reason not to put ninety percent of your own money in? Because you're paying a ten percent fee. I mean, it, it's like if you open up a restaurant and you're trying to make it look busy, so you buy a thousand dollars worth of food and keep sitting there eating. <laughs> yeah, you're not making any money. Yeah, but well, I mean, the problem is that the investors can't do due diligence. There's no way for them to do due diligence. Okay. Now there is merit at the beginning and the end of what we might call priming the pump. In other words, getting some money in there. Um, some of you may be familiar with how most charities that have a campaign have something called the silent campaign. I don't know about you, but in my hometown, the United Way has a thermometer on the town square. It's like this red actual thermometer, and as they get contributions, I don't know if they magic marker it in or what, but the little red thing goes up, and people can see that the campaign is doing well they will actually spend six months before that campaign starts talking to large donors and say we're gearing up for our annual campaign and those people will contribute and they'll hold on to it and then the first couple of weeks of that campaign they'll start putting that into the campaign and the dollar amount will go up pretty quickly and people go wow united way is attracting a lot of attention this year looking good yeah it's probably time for us to send in our contribution even with a charity, if you kept driving by and you go, wow, nobody's contributing this year. Uh, I don't think I'm going to be the first one. I'll wait and see how it goes. Okay? So charities are doing all those same things, priming the pump, showing the progress, um, having artificial deadlines, you know, all of that to try to stimulate contribution. Okay? So that's Kickstarter, all or none. Indiegogo and a bunch of other uh, platforms have a take what you make policy. So on Indiegogo, if you're trying to raise $10,000 and you only get $9,000, they'll email you and say, okay, you didn't reach $10,000. Do you want the $9,000? Sometimes if it really did cost $10,001 for the production, you say, no, oh, there's nothing I can do with $9,000. Thanks. Sometimes you go, yeah, I'll make do. But there's a difference in the fee. Indiegogo charges a 4% fee for successful campaigns, a 9% fee for unsuccessful campaigns. So there's still reason to think carefully about the goal. Don't just make this arbitrary high goal. The general rule is projects with smaller goals are more successful than those with larger goals. I mean, think about it. That's human nature. Mm -hmm. Does it psychologically make a difference in somebody's mind to say, well, if I give it to somebody who's going to take what you make, they don't make their goal, but I just give them money, okay. and it's not going to be useless for versus, you know. I would say they probably wouldn't know that in the first place. Like, it wouldn't be evident from the campaign. And second, they probably wouldn't care. Uh, you have to look at what their original motivation is. And if they're trying to get that CD from an artist that they're a fan of, it's probably going to be immaterial. Like, what if they get this level and that? What if they pay more of a fee for that? Either they want the CD or they don't. That would be my guess. Had somebody else. Okay. 
as a contributor, you do, and have you contributed to a lot of crowdfunding campaigns? Okay, you're probably in like the 99th percentile of the general public. <laughs> I don't think so. How many of you here have contributed to a crowdfunding campaign? Okay, I mean, that's so high above the national average that, you know, like, above average group. yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're almost in crowdfunding geek territory here or something. I mean, seriously, all the way back to Mansfield, I could stop every car and ask them, and I thought I'd find one person that even knows what crowdfunding is. Leave alone having actually done it, okay? The smaller the dollar amount, the easier everything goes. Um, you know, let's say my car broke down or something, and I'm going, hey, people, I mean, you came here, you got pizza, can you kind of spot me a few bucks to get a Greyhound bus back to Mansfield? <laughs> I mean, yeah, all right, here's a five, here's two, you know, I only need $25. But if I said something like, hey, uh, it's $290 for a flight to Miami, can you help me out here? You just say, no, like my five bucks isn't going to do much. My 10 bucks isn't going to be significant. So the larger the goal, the larger amount you expect from people, the tougher it is. That's just human nature. Yep. You talked about there being different platforms that are kind of topic specific. Yep. What is the decision process like to decide if your car gets fixed? If you put your fixing the car up on a medical device platform or like the monitoring body or something? I, you just have to think about who am I trying to reach? And based on my research on these different platforms, who is most likely to be able to reach those people? Pardon me? Yeah. Who's going to look at it, or how are they going to be receptive to it? Because in a minute, I'm almost going to contradict that and say no matter what platform you choose, you're going to be the person responsible for driving people to that site. So in the end, it's not a huge difference. You could just tell all your People go to medstarter.com as well as go to kickstarter.com. But anything you can do to get an edge, wider publicity, more people that look at it, more people that have heard of it, probably the better off you're going to be. Okay? Okay. $100,000. Try to stay away from it. Only 2% of crowdfunding campaigns of $100,000 or more will meet their goal. So just in case you're out there casually saying, yeah, I think I'll go for about $110,000, there's a comma there, and you're saying, I believe I will be in the 98th percentile of all crowdfunding campaigns in crowdfunding history. If you have some reason to believe that, go for that. But if you're just somebody sitting in Athens, Ohio, saying, I think I'll try crowdfunding, you're probably not going to be in the 98th percentile of all crowdfunding campaigns everywhere. Okay? I had a meeting with somebody from uh, Akron that uh, had a game, a uh, multi-person gaming thing, and I said, what's your goal? And he said, $115,000. And I said, oh, why that? And he said, oh, I don't know. We just thought, you know, we might as well get as much money as we can in this one campaign. And I said, where are you at now? And he said, about 1100 And I told him this statistic. And there was like a big pause. I wasn't sure if he was vomiting into the trash can, <laughs> if he had just passed out, if he ran out of the building. Um, and then he said, I wish I would have talked to you before the campaign. Does that knowledge spin the competition and bump the odds, really? Um, it just means people are more realistic about their goal. Like, and we're going to look at the success rate, by the way, of crowdfunding campaigns. What would you guess it is? Would you say this is a 50-50 shot or better or worse? 20 or less. Yep. And with a heavy, heavy skew toward very small campaigns, $2,000, $5,000. Yeah, this is not easy street here. It's a lot of work to do a successful crowdfunding campaign. Yep. If you have a large campaign, say you set up a $100,000 campaign. Yep, $100,000 campaign. If you present your rationale, like you say, this, that, you know, this amount of money is going to be for this and this and this, and you kind of list it down and itemize why it's 
by you for the hundred thousand dollars, does that enhance your probability of people Maybe. I mean, the more you explain, the more of a compelling case you make, the more successful you're going to be. And we're going to look at some videos, so you'll start to see the psychological ploy that people use. But the dollar amount is just so much greater. You know, it's like anything else. If you're just going to go out, uh, you know, on the corner and put your hat out on the curb and say, hey, help me out, I'm out of work. If your goal is to raise $50,000, that's going to be a lot different than if it's to raise $50. Okay, it's just the sheer dollar amount of what you're trying to do. Is there any type of phasing? You know, like you have, say, $100,000 goal. Yep. But you break it out in 10 steps. Typically not, because if you're dealing with a product, like you need the money to do what you say you're going to do. Like if you were a fan of some musician, and they said, hey, we're just going to get $5,000 now. We're not even going to go in the studio yet. <laughs> You know, we'll just hang on to that, and then in six months, we'll raise another 5000 and we'll at least book the studio, and then late next year, we'll actually do this. Yeah, let's say, why am I contributing now then? You know, people want the whole thing to be finished and done, okay? There's a, uh, a woman named Sally Outlaw, her name is just like it sounds, who's written a book about crowdfunding. She's a consultant, and she runs a crowdfunding academy. She's Florida-based. She specializes in second campaigns. So in other words, her clients are people that had a campaign, it didn't work, and now they pay her as a consultant to retool the campaign and try to make it successful. The biggest thing she does is lower the goal. And there's a very famous case study of a company that tried to raise $380,000 and they raised $80,000. She got hold of them and set a goal of 80,000 and it raised 380,000. Okay? So campaigns can be oversubscribed, in case you didn't notice. They can go more than their goal. If you say, I'm hoping to raise $5,000 to do the tooling and go into production, and you raise $100,000, then you're just pre selling more of those. No harm done. That's a great thing. So you're better off setting the lowest goal that will accomplish what you want and hope maybe it goes over goal. Okay? Now, we haven't specifically mentioned it yet, but there's something called the tipping point. So we saw that one that had zero. Take a look at this screenshot here, if you can see it from the back of the room. Green Unite specializes in environmentally friendly and supportive projects. So they've got the water can, the school energy partners, and teach a woman to fish. Those are the three campaigns they're funding. Maybe that appeals to some of you. Is anybody thinking about contributing to any of these campaigns? Is there any reason why you wouldn't be excited about them? Yeah, you go, wait a minute, what the heck kind of project is this? It's got six days to go and zero people. This is where Jen says, doesn't that person have a mother? Come on, somebody should have contributed by now. And now you start to say, wait a minute, the whole platform, nobody's contributing anything. Why would I put my money into that? Maybe it's a scam. Forget it. That platform doesn't exist anymore. Is anybody surprised? If you just can't get any traction, you never get to the point where people take it seriously. Now, we'll see some stats from Kickstarter after a while. They're going to use 20% as sort of a threshold. I use 40% as a threshold. So I think we can agree that up to 20% People keep looking at it, and you're 10% funded, 15% funded. Boy, that's tough to overcome. Somewhere between 20 and 40%, people go, oh, that's not too bad. Well, it's, it just started. It's got 50 days to go. I think that means it just started 10 days ago, and it's already at the 25% mark. That's not too bad. Certainly, once you get halfway, people can realistically believe that this is going to happen, and they'll end up getting their credit card charged, and they will ultimately get that product or contribute to what it is they want. 
So there is a tipping point, a threshold. Okay. So we talked about why not put all the money in yourself. Maybe to reach a tipping point, that might make sense. You know, again, the only problem with having your mother contribute is chances are she probably would have contributed directly to you. So now you're just giving up 10% fee on everything she gives you. But yet, if her money is going to get you over some threshold, it might be worth doing. Yeah, we, um, we had that issue when we did a GoFunding campaign for the um, employees that were affected by the fire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So that can we just give to you directly? Sure. And we finally ended up having to say, no, we really need you to go through this platform. And it had something to do with, um, you know, the contractual obligation that we, that we signed yeah. with them. Yeah. But it, it was a significant issue because we had several contributors that decided not to contribute at all because they were turned off by 10% of their money. Yeah, going yeah, to I can see that. Uh, I've done stuff like that. Um, I was active in Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts as a leader and running those fundraisers. And I always tried to pick something where, you know, like M&Ms, where it costs 50 cents and we got 25 cents and the company got 25. And then I've had kids that come home with like those candles that cost $20 and they're getting $3 from it or something like that. And there have been kids where, you know, come around my house and say, yeah, I'm selling this for $20. And I go, how about if I just give you $5? <laughs> Because the school's going to get more than if I buy this thing, and I'm going to pay a lot less. And obviously, the kids aren't sophisticated enough to <laughs> figure out what's going well, on. No, they said we had to sell these. <laughs> but sometimes, if I talk to the advisor or the leader or something, I'll say, hey, you know, I'll make a, here's five bucks, put it in the pool. Uh, people not wanting to contribute to something charitable because they think fees and overhead and stuff. I'd call it the what was it the Red Cross director making seven hundred and fifty thousand a year and flying first class effect. <laughs> yeah, I think people are very conscious of that. That's one of the things United Way has to overcome because they're a whole organization with staff and buildings and everything just to pass the money on to other charities. And people say, wait a minute, I give a hundred, and sorry if you're active in United Way, it's just the math of it. Uh, if I give a hundred dollars to United Way, 20 of it disappears right there just to hand the money over to the charity. And then 20% of that goes into their overhead. So it's like, you know, I'm only given $60 by doing this campaign. I'd rather just drive directly to the charity and hand them the money or better yet, go right to the homeless people and give them the money or something instead of all these people taking their 20%. You have to choose the rewards. What do you expect from people? Are you saying, hey, just give me five bucks, give me a hundred bucks? Um, had a guy talk to me about a diesel engine where you know, it was going to cost like a million dollars to build this thing. And he said, well, if I can just get X number of people contributing $500, <laughs> a lot for somebody to pay. You know, five bucks is easier. If, he from? Pardon me? Where is he from? <laughs> Ohio. No, he was up by uh, Norwalk or something like that, I think, up in the northern part of the state. <laughs> okay, so you'll see most campaigns have several choices, and they usually start at a dollar. I mean, there'll actually be things like, yeah, we're selling this uh, wearable tech, but for a dollar, you'll know that you helped us do it. For five dollars, we'll send you a thank you email. For $20, we'll put your name on our website. Um, for $30, we'll send you this nice t-shirt saying, I contributed to this person's campaign. Then you start to get into purchasing the actual product itself. So most will give options. Um, obviously, if you're doing product crowdfunding, if it's a low dollar product, people are more likely to pay 10 or 20 bucks and actually get something in return, okay? And remember we talked about particularly if they think they're getting it at a discounted price. Yes? For the like, low dollar amount rewards, 
Yep. Yep. They're not, because, I mean, if I told you I'm developing some keyboard, and I say for $10 you can have a, a keychain that says <laughs> the so-and-so keyboard on it, or a sticker, it's like, what do I want that for? Yeah. But sometimes you run into people that are just trying to be supportive. You know, like if your mom doesn't want some wearable tech. <laughs> You know, she might put 10 bucks to have a t-shirt that says, I helped my son, or I contributed to my daughter's campaign, or something like that, okay? Um, and it's like any other kind of gift thing. Like if you go to a sporting team gift shop, there's always going to be like a keychain for $5 or something if you don't want to buy the team jersey for $90. You know, they'll find something so fans can act like they're supporting the team by buying a $5 keychain. They never really think about there's no way that helps the team, but <laughs> makes them think they do. Okay? Well, let's talk about videos, because that ends up being a very critical component, particularly for larger campaigns. Uh, videos are becoming increasingly important. The sophistication level of videos is becoming important and uh, increasing. Uh, like any kind of message, it's got to grab people's attention. Shorter is better than longer. I've never worked with an entrepreneur where I said, you may want to stretch that video out a little more. <laughs> okay, the more concise and to the point you can be, the better. Try to have some reason for people to contribute. Occasionally, it's the product itself. It's so cool, I want to have it. But often, they like to think there's some added value of them helping you out or their money's really going to make a difference. We're going to watch about three crowdfunding videos, and then I'm going to point out some of the key factors here. Put it where you want it. Okay. Okay. purpose. Um, how many of you, once you found out what the product was, said, yeah, I might be interested in that? And how many of you, once you saw what it was, said, nah, that just wouldn't fit into what I do? And was there anyone in that second category that by the time the video ended, you had changed your mind? No. You can't sell people based on the video. They either want it or they don't. Okay? You've heard that expression, it was like from a movie where the woman said, you had me at hello. 
Okay, it's like you want something, you want somebody, that happens pretty quickly, okay? They could go on and on about, oh, you could use it in hotels, you could use it in libraries. Oh, look, you could put it in your pocket and it only takes up that much room. Like, almost no one's going to say, oh, all right then, I guess maybe I'll buy one. So don't spend a lot of time on a video trying to sell a product. It's probably not going to happen. This retailed for about $50.00. They sold it for 35 on the crowdfunding campaign. So people did get a deep discount. This was a successful project. They were only looking to get 65,000 or something like that, and they got more like 165,000. And they went into production and they made the product. Okay? That's why we created a better way to preserve the freshness in leftover fruits and vegetables. Food huggers. Just pop your leftover half into a hugger and save it for later. Food huggers come in four sizes so that every half has a hugger that fits. When designing the huggers, we measure the loads of fruits and veggies to figure out just the right sizes to fit all of our fresh foods. We sketched up a lot of designs and considered multiple different constructions. And then took our best concept and built it into a 3D computer model so that we could consider and meticulously resolve every detail of production. We made a lot of prototypes and tested them like crazy. The flex in the silicone gives a tight seal and hugs your food to help you save that second half. The food huggers make great can toppers too. The next step for food huggers is to order tooling and purchase a production run. Each of those costs thousands of dollars. It's too much for two gals to do alone. In order for us to make this food huggers thing happen, we need the support of people like you. Each Kickstarter supporter will receive their own set of food huggers from the very first production batch. If you love your food, give them. <laughs> So how many of you are going to leave here and say, I actually want to look that up. I'd actually like to have that product. How many of you are kind of on the fence? Like you were somewhat intrigued by it, but you're not really going to run home and purchase it. And how many just don't have a use for it? <laughs> a set of four for $16. So now even some of the marginal people might say, yeah, for 16 bucks, I'll get this for my sister-in-law. You know, her birthday's coming up. What's better than the gift of food huggers for her 30th birthday? <laughs> okay. So you can see the effect of that low ticket price. If, if they would have said for $80, you can get a set of 10 or something, you go, wow, that's a lot to pay. 16 bucks is doable. You also notice... <laughs> you also notice how they're saying, we need you. Like, you're actually going to make a difference here. We can't handle this ourselves. So you say, oh, they seem like nice people. They have a good idea. In addition to getting something that could be a cool product, let's help them out. Yep. I mean, if the alternative, I worked with a guy who had a restaurant and developed some food products and wanted to do a crowdfunding campaign. And I just said, like, what are you going to say? Like, I'm an upper middle class, fairly wealthy entrepreneur that's looking for yet one more way to make money. <laughs> Help me out here, will you? I said, you're missing that compelling story. Hey, Kickstarter. My name is Simon. And this is Neptune's farm. Over the last year, there have been so many new smartwatches appearing on the market, but none of them really seem to be living up to the hype. They're usually sold as Bluetooth accessories for your phone, either for fitness tracking or as some sort of notification center. We believe that a smartwatch should be a truly standalone device. That's why we created Neptune's Pine, the only device you'll ever need. Pine is at the top of the food chain 
when it comes to smartwatches, packing more features than any wristborne device out there without the need of a nearby smartphone. Just insert your micro SIM card and it allows you to make and receive phone calls and send SMS text messages. With 3G and Wi-Fi, you can conveniently browse your favorite websites, your social networks, your email, and much more. It's a complete world web experience on your wrist. Hi, my name is Aaron Wilkins and I'm CTO at Net. smartwatches about a year ago, we realized that one of the big problems is all the apps that we custom tailored to a specific device. We've been able to make our device compatible with a huge number of existing Android apps. So the fact that we have an accelerometer, the fact that we have a GPS, you know, all these things, they open up uh, a world of possibilities for developers to be able to take advantage of this technology, and it's specifically in this form factor. What's really cool about the Pine is that we have a front-facing VGA camera and a rear-facing front facing VGA camera lets you do video chat. Right now we're the only smartwatch that can do video chat. The rear facing camera lets you take hard resolution video or still images. We've got flashes on both cameras so you can use any lighting condition. And what's cool about the Pine is you can use a flashlight or a heart rate monitor with existing applications. We went through a lot of trouble to make sure that the, the connection mechanism was you know, released fluidly, that we can put it back in and stay safe and secure and not fall out of the stress. We finalized most of the design and engineering and we're getting very close to mass production. However, we still need your help and support to get the pine on here. We hope you join us on this journey and support us on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Thanks for listening. What do you think? Yeah, pretty long. Same kind of thing. Some of you are intrigued by that. It probably has a little more value pointing out some of the features. I could see something along the way, like, oh, a heart monitor. Okay, you know, I could use something like that. But if you had no interest in it, there's nothing he can do to bring you around. So that sold for about $400. Early crowdfunding contributors could get it for $299, I think. It was a very successful campaign. It tapped into a group of people that wanted that. Yep. I have no idea. They were from Montreal, so maybe it had something to do with pine forests or something like that. <laughs> All right. The uh, quality of the video is obviously going to make a difference. A clear message, sticking to the big picture and not getting bogged down in details. You'll notice uh, Surfies even said you can look on the screen and see the rewards and all that. I'm not going to take up video time to do that. And the shorter, the better. So how are you going to promote this? I already said you can't just put it up there, turn in the video, tell some friends, hey, I'm on Kickstarter, check it out, and then just sit there and watch the money roll in. I did a uh, panel at Kent State University with three successful crowdfunding campaigns. One of them is Tiny Circuits, if anybody's into mini Arduinos. And there was a woman who had an open source loom. And son of a gun, if she didn't say, I just put this out there on the internet and I used to get up in the morning and make coffee and crank up my computer and see what money had rolled in overnight. Like I spent my whole life telling people that doesn't happen. And then she's sitting there talking about how that happened. It's, <laughs> it's happening to me right now. Yeah. I'm not okay. But she tapped into a community. Open source looms is nothing I know about, but if you're into that, word spreads like wildfire throughout the open source loom community, and they all flock to it and wanted to help it out. The Arduinos is the same thing. Anybody into Arduinos? It's like you're weird people. The Arduinos are your life, and I've seen meetings of people just talk about Arduinos all day. I'm lucky I know what they are, and I do now know what they are. And Arduino is Italian. But yeah, you tap into that community and it can be pretty successful. So here's another important concept. I call it fan base. There's got to be some group that will back this that you're already a part of or that you can reach. Musicians are successful with crowdfunding because they've got 165,000 fans on their Facebook page. As soon as they put the word out, yeah, the money starts rolling in. 
The guy with the diabetes needle in Mentor, <laughs> nobody even knew he was doing this. He has no fans. So I told him, if you don't have a fan base, borrow or rent or steal a fan base somewhere. Get the American Diabetes Association to do an article on you. Get the bloggers to talk about you. If you're doing something animal related, get the dog rescue groups to back this and put it in their newsletter and things like that. So you have to have some kind of a natural community or fan base or else you're putting yourself in a situation. The big boys in the world of smartwatches, including the 100 billion, 20 billion plus market cap of Qualcomm and the Nikes and the Samsungs. Joining us now in a Fox Business exclusive, Simon Tian, he's Neptune computer founder and CEO. Well, this certainly caught our eye, Simon. I have to tell you because you've come out with something called the Neptune Pine. Why is it different? Why do you believe yours may very well be better than what Samsung already has come out with and same with uh, Qualcomm? Mm. Well, what's really different from our product is really the fact that the Pine is a completely standalone device, which means that you can basically do voice calls, text messaging, uh, browse the internet, and receive GPS navigation, all that without the, the dependency on a nearby smartphone. We're showing it on the screen, keep it up here. It's got a slightly bigger screen than say, for example, the Talk or some of the other smartwatches yes. that are out there, but it does a lot. And as you say, it's not tethered to a smartphone. Exactly. So it completely replaces it. What is that, GPS, web browsing, 3G, Wi-Fi, voice texting? Yes, all of that and Bluetooth as well. And the screen size was really chosen for 1.2 gigahertz dual core process. Okay, so how many do you have out there? How can people buy them? Uh, well, we're, we're producing 2.5K, uh, 2 so 2,500 2, units for uh, end of January for our Kickstarter backers. And uh, right now you can, you can pledge on our Kickstarter page at discounted prices. Um, the manufacturing, the, the, the final price would be uh, 335 for the 16 gigabyte version and 395 for the uh, okay. 32 gigabyte. Let me show. Let me explain what we're seeing on the screen here. This is your Kickstarter page. This is where people can yeah. actually invest in your company. You opened on Monday night at 11 p.m. The Kickstarter opportunity for investors. You expected what 100 grand? You have already have 243 thousand dollars that people have already put in there. Well, now it's 248 thousand. Oh my God. It's since we started putting together the notes this morning. That is and it amazing. jumped immediately after that. <laughs> um, I would say probably um, probably yes, but the chances are slimmer. Uh, I, I think Kickstarter is, a, is really a great camp, uh, a, a really great platform to launch uh, new projects such as, uh, such as our smartwatch. Well, l let me just show that video again of, of where, where they're actually touching the screen because I find that really mm -hmm. fascinating. And and now I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, if I'm a Qualcomm or a Samsung, I want to own this thing or I don't want it out there. I see it as a QWERTY keyboard. Uh, have you been approached yet? Um, I, I can't really disclose much. But, uh, <laughs> they can't even find that, you up um, there in, in Montreal. <laughs> they're looking for you. <laughs> what you would say if a Samsung came to you and said, let, let, son, let us just take this off your hands. <laughs> uh, well, uh, for me, it's really, I, I really want to build uh, my own company, and I, I have a, a far more um, long-term vision for Neptune. So, uh, well, it, it always depends on what you're offering, of course. Uh, but for now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to stick with, uh, with staying with Company. With your dream. Good for you. Simon yes. Tian is the Neptune Computer founder and CEO living the dream. It's a beautiful product. Uh, we look forward when you're in town to come see us in New York. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. The Neptune Pie. A little bit different between the Zanesville paper and Fox News, but you get the idea. Any kind of publicity or coverage you can get, and the campaign itself is a news item. It's uh, happening depending on industry and market. So we said the uh, final component here is fulfillment, being able to follow up and deal with a successful campaign. Um, sometimes dealing with a successful campaign is more difficult than dealing with a, a failed campaign. People struggle. There have been lots of cases of people taking months to get the product out to people. What do you do if you buy something, pay for it with your credit card, and nine months later still don't have it? 
you call up the credit card company and say cancel this transaction. So it can create all kinds of problems for you if you delay uh, getting this product out there. So you've got to remember a pre-sale campaign, that's selling the product. You can't sell more than what you can handle delivering. And there have been numerous cases of people that have been overwhelmed by the response. Um, even on a small campaign, there's a woman who's an art history professor State state people. So this map in green is all of the states that have a provision like that. Yellow is where it's currently under consideration, and only California has looked at a form of this and rejected it. All the gray states are doing nothing, and I can assure you the Ohio legislature has done nothing. Absolutely nothing. It's not even on the radar. You could ask all 99 members of the Ohio General Assembly, hey, any talk of equity crowdfunding? And they would just go, I don't know what you're talking about. I mean, it just has not been broached in Ohio. Okay. Let's look at some stats. These are actually from a couple months ago, but it doesn't change much. This is the amount of money that Kickstarter has had pledged. 90,000 successful projects out of 250 launched. Here's the key factor. Even the granddaddy of them all, Kickstarter, the success rate is 37%. And most of the successful ones are under $10,000. While 14% of projects finished having never received a single pledge, Good thing Jen left the room, because she was upset about those couple of campaigns we saw with zero. Imagine if she knew 14% of Kickstarter projects had zero. Again, like, where are these people's mothers? Nobody contributed to them. But once they hit 20% of their goal, 79% of them are successful. So there's something kind of magical about hitting 20%. Now you're taken seriously. I say 40% if you want some guarantee that people will want to contribute to this. If you want to keep up on what's going on, like some of you who are staff of tech growth or your business advisors, there's a few sites that you can check periodically. The Crowdfunding Professionals Association, and the National Crowdfunding Association are sort of like the two big trade associations for people that are involved in the crowdfunding industry. But from more of a consumer standpoint, there's a uh, online news source called Crowdfund Insider that just tends to have daily news about what's going on, successful campaigns, new platforms, news about the crowdfunding world. Uh, they're Cleveland-based. And in the interest of disclosure, I've worked with them and advised them. They're sort of a client of my incubator program. Um, I hardly ever look at their website. I just uh, follow them on Twitter. And once or twice a day, there'll be some little news item about what's going on in crowdfunding. So a couple of sources that you might want to consult. So what have we talked about today? Remember we said that Crowdfunding is just one type of crowdsourcing. There are several different types of crowdfunding. Remember, maybe you'll agree with me now, they probably shouldn't all be called crowdfunding. I mean, there's a huge difference between giving somebody $20 for medical expenses and buying an equity stake in a startup company. A uh, lot, 500 platforms to choose from, charging different fees. You have to choose your goal. You have to choose your rewards. You have to produce a video. You have to promote it. You have to follow up. The Jobs Act and the regulations of the Securities and Exchange Commission are going to be the big game changer in crowdfunding. All kinds of people now who say, I can't crowdfund, no Doctors with whom we have a personal business relationship. 
but I don't know how to do it. I'll go across the back here. And you introduce yourself at the beginning, and you hopefully know me by now. So thank you very much for coming, and any final words yeah. from you? For what? Uh, so mainly to, to either tear down an existing building and rebuild, uh, or to take over the existing building for like new equipment. And what's the incentive for people to contribute? Um, I think being able to help a local, you know, we're started locally, we're really locally involved in the local town, and to put ourselves under a new place to improve our menu, improve our so if it's going to be local people contributing, yeah. Yeah. probably doesn't make sense to go with a crowdfunding platform. Yeah. Probably makes sense to do more of a direct contribution. Thing. So one thing that I did come across is, is people who have started some crowdfunding, right, to get, to capture this work um, and go out and do more independent one-on-ones to score big numbers and then take that cash and put it into crowdfunding to reach that 20, 40 percent mark. Mm -hmm. Does that work, or is that solid? I mean, what if a guy had a machine shop in Des Moines, and he wanted to grow it, get into a new building? Would you contribute to that? Probably not. Okay. So that guy in Des Moines, why is he going to contribute to your restaurant? I guess the reason why I'd more think about doing it this way is if people come in to, you know, to our restaurant, give them information that they can go online and, and give it to this. Um, it, it, it's more of a, a transparency issue of saying, like, I'm just not going to take $5 from you right now and put it in my pocket and say, oh, we tried to do something, but it didn't make it. You, you know, like, I just, I don't want, because that's the one thing I can't get myself over. Set up your own PayPal account. And just say, we're trying to raise, how much did you say? You know, I have, I'm still putting the numbers together. Yeah, but. It could go as high as 500. It could that's an awful, as awful lot. I know. And I, so just hearing what you said about yeah. how that works, it, it, yeah. it's putting me in. Like, I mean, if you said, for, you know, with $100,000, we're going to demolish this building, we're going to build this state-of-the-art yeah. thing, here's the artist's rendering of it, it's going to make this area of Athens look yeah. really nice, it'll be an asset to the area, um, here's how we're doing it, go to 